Hi, it's Ray from Pro Shaper in Charlton, Massachusetts, and uh, this is part nine of building the all aluminum E type nose. And this is the part we're going to be working on tonight. We had a little hiatus again. It's been a couple of weeks since we got back to this, and uh, here we are again. And I uh, want to do a little analysis of what we're trying to do. This is the blank. We're going to make this part right here. Mark has made the gauges and the flexible shape pattern. So we take that flexible shape pattern off. It's all been dusted and everything. And let's do analysis of this surface. So we've got a rock going this way and we have a rock going this way. So this part of the panel here is a standard compound curve. Let's look up over here. Here we've got a rock going this way and a rock going this way standard compound curve but this is a valley the valley has got a rock going this way but it also has a rock going that way so the the radius is going this way so that defines it as a reverse curve a lot of my students will see this and they'll go okay this is a standard this is a standard I'm going to hit this from the back of the panel or wheel it hard or wheel it or hit it from here to get this and they look at this reverse and they think well I just got to hit it down well if you do that that's the death of the panel that's one of the most unforgivable sins if you hit a valley in a reverse curve you've made your work so much harder you can recover you might have to use heat to recover but it can it can take a lot of time to fix that problem what you do to make that reverse curve is you bring up the areas around it that stays uh, unaffected and you'll get that nice reverse curve so we've got it defined here. This is the, the center of the valley or close to it. And uh, you can see that fits on there beautiful. And this is the same little joggle. It's the seat for the headlight uh, cover on the C-type. So that'll be a secondary operation. And then it also has a flange here with the fender bolts on and it's got a bolt pattern on it. And that'll be a secondary operation. So this is part nine, and uh, hopefully we get this done in one or two parts, and then we're going to be doing part ten, and uh, that'll be immediately after this one. We're not going to do on video those two sections because essentially they're just the same as this. So um, just to make the video a little bit shorter, as you know, it's probably uh, 15 hours or 20 hours or whatever so far, and. Uh, I'm trying to build the channel and if people see an hour long video sometimes they uh, don't think there's a, an hour's time that they can spend on it so they tune out quick. So there's some really good information here if you spend the time and watch. Um, I've noticed a lot of the videos that have a million hits or so all you see is the guy's hands like this and he doesn't say anything and he's generally got a right angle little grinder with a, a cutoff wheel and he's making a couple cuts and his sparks and stuff and then he's got a, a MIG welder and he makes this thing and he gets a million six videos views on the video I just don't understand it so this is a little more complicated I appreciate the people that have taken the patience to watch what I'm trying to do here it's an amazing craft. Uh, I believe just about anybody can learn it. I might be wrong in my assessment of that. I don't know. But if you give it a try, an honest try, I think you can do it. So we're going to make that pot tonight. And this is the blank. It's 063 H14 aluminum. And this is the Chinese source stuff. It is super stiff. I could anneal it and make it a lot easier, but uh, I'm not going to anneal it. So we're going to start off and what we got to do is if we put the flexible shape pattern on here you'll see that this compound curve here really is not showing that strongly in the flexible shape pattern. It's there but it's not really showing too, too strongly. This one here is which is a reflection of the fact that there's a valley and it's kind of elevated there. 
So first thing we're going to do is we locate this properly. I got it located right here on the blank. I've got ample uh, material all around, extra on the edges. You can always cut it later. And the first order of business will be, okay, I can wheel this thing the whole way or I can bash it a little bit. And I'll probably bash it over here to bring this up. And uh, as soon as I do that, I can maybe bash it a little bit in here too or I might wheel it, we'll see. So I got the wheels all cleaned up. I sanded them. Uh, I do have a video on cleaning the wheels if you really want to uh, clean your wheels really nice. There's a nice video on how to do it on my uh, Pro Shaper YouTube channel. Making these videos, oftentimes I use these markers and I was uh, saying that the Shopee brand, which I've bought innumerable of, I, I replaced it with Milwaukee's and uh, someone uh, in the comments section said uh, and it, the Milwaukee's I, I really like a lot too are the fine ones but they, they don't last long so in the comments section someone said that the Milwaukee makes the fine one so I did buy a box of the Milwaukee fines and I got a report that they're excellent I, I got them online they don't have them at Home Depot but uh, it was Zeke I think from Colorado sent me these, these nice Japanese ones that double-ended and I want to thank Zeke for sending me these. These are just awesome. Uh, they've got a super fine on one end and uh, better than the, the standard fine on the other end. And I'm just hoping to have a long longevity to them. Uh, they're called Identil, Identil Pen. I-D-E-N-T-L-P-E-N. -E -E and they're made in Japan. And nice ink. They look like they do a nice job and I'm really impressed with them. So I use that whenever I have to make a fine line. For instance, if I'm going to do a cut line or, or a bend line, I want a super fine shoppy mark on here. So that's where I use them. So thank you Zeke for that. And uh, I think it's just great that uh, some of my followers think enough of me that they sent me stuff like that. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Randy. Uh, Randy watched one of my videos on sh cutting sheet metal and I, I mentioned the fact that I like these pro snip uh, sheet metal shears and uh, he must have had a couple extra pairs and the, the pin is broken on this one. They were a little rusty and he hadn't been using them. He might have been using something else. These, these are just uh, amazing and I think the company went out of business a long time ago. And the reason why I like them is they have this offset that allows you to cut, uh, so you can cut both ways with them almost, even though one's a left and one's a right. Um, so I'm going to restore these up, I'll sharpen them, and I'll put longer handles on them. So when these are set up properly, you can cut 16 gauge with them, uh, and, and they cut it really nicely. So thank you much, uh, Randy from Texas, for sending these up to me. I really appreciate it. So let's get going on the shaping. Probably lost uh, 50 people already. So, okay, folks, welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> We're doing the eat I put. It's a it's a complicated piece. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to bop this out right here. All right, so here we are. We've got the flexible shape pattern on here. We've got ample room all around, and I located it preliminary. I just put a little line here based on the uh, mark where that reverse valley is, reverse curve valley. And, uh, you know, part of this craft is a big major component is measuring, and this is a measuring tool. And uh, what you do with the measuring tool is you follow its, its dictates. And in his, this case here, this is telling me that I got to knock this out and make this fit it. So uh, what's important is the targeting. I've got uh, an oval here and oftentimes it's an oval area and I marked it on the top of the panel and now I've transferred that over by eye here and I'm going to start bashing that thing out. So now Again, you can do this a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, I, I prefer doing this bashing because it's, uh, the results are a lot faster. Um, you can do this totally with the English wheel patent technique. Uh, and, you, and it yields a beautiful result. So, 
every, the, the, that way works. And, and my general rule of thumb is there's four ways to do every human task. Of the four ways, two might be a little better than the others. So you can do it the Italian method by hitting this on a, on the uh, with an auto body hammer on a flat slab. You can do it with the English method with uh, a patent wheeling. You can do it this method here, which is bashing it out. And I think probably the Italians do that too. And um, doing the rough shaping anyways. And you can also use a power hammer to uh, stretch this all out and shrink where you'd want to. This one really is a stretch all panel mostly. So all four of those ways will work very well. As I said, this is this Chinese source uh, 063 3003 aluminum, super hot stuff. So, but it does take uh, it does take the shape that you want. Uh, it's a little reluctant. You got to use a little effort on it, and it yields a really nice, super strong panel. So everything you do, you want to quantify. So as I started out. We've got probably a two inch rise here at its highest point. And uh, as I beat it out here, that two inches is gonna become an inch. Then it becomes a half an inch. Then it becomes a quarter of an inch. So you constantly feed back off of your blueprint. The blueprint is the flexible shape pad. If you're using a buck, the blueprint is the buck. So you have to, you have to follow the measurements of your blueprint. Now every time I hammer, I try not to hammer in the same spot. If you hammer in the same spot, um, you're asking that piece of metal to do a little bit too much. And one of the things that my students do oftentimes, they say, well geez, this doesn't seem to move it so fast. Maybe I'll put a sharper end on. So this is the medium crown, this is the low crown. And I have a couple of hammers or mallets with uh, a very high crown on them. And they'll, they'll use that high crown. And when you do that, you're asking the metal to do a little too much work and you get what's called stretch marks. And um, the stretch marks don't really mean too much. It's a point where you've actually sort of semi-damaged the metal. If you compression stretch over it, it will heal it or uh, cold uh, forge it back together again. But if you do it too much, it's not a good thing. So I don't encourage it at all. So using the right tool for the job is super important. That's something I learned at my grandfather's when I was like 12 years old. He would yell at me constantly, right tool for the job. So, So we hammer that out. I know I'm not there yet, but I've got to see incrementally what I've done. And I want to make sure that I've hit in the right spot. So I don't want to go into this valley at all. So I'm going to stay away from the valley. The, the, the ten com one of the two commandments of metal shaping is thou shalt not hit the valley, the reverse curve valley. So if you do, and that oftentimes happens with students, they don't have a real thorough understanding of how important it is to stay away from that valley. And, you know, there might be a whole bunch of hits over here, and then all of a sudden they migrate over here because they weren't thinking and weren't paying attention, and that causes a lot of pain and suffering. It can take you hours to fix that problem, so don't do it. Everything is fixable, but it, at some point it becomes so much work to fix a panel, it's easier to start over. So best to do the sequence right, best to quantify, best to follow the directions of your flexible shape pattern or buck. Constantly feed off of it. Now another thing about hitting with a mallet is, as you can see, I'm lifting and I'm dropping. Lifting and then dropping. I might accelerate the down but I'm not putting too much effort into it. And a lot of my students, I've probably said this in other videos too, they'll take and they'll, they'll put their whole entire body into it 
And when they do that, they're going to lose control and they start sweating and uh, the muscles ache and all that stuff. This will get my, my, my heart pumping a little bit, but, you know, I do it in a measured way. And what's nice about this approach is I think it has a very wide appeal. A lot of people don't have, uh, you know, twenty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars to buy a power hammer. Uh, a lot of people lust over the fact that you can turn the power hammer on and brrr, does all this work for you. Um, and it sounds all appealing. I have one and I could use it, but I prefer to do it this way. Not because I'm hot-headed, but I think I have a lot more control over it. And I really like the finish from the English wheel a lot better. So, and uh, my class, I try to appeal with my class to people that are in realistic situations. They're working out of a two-car garage. They don't have that kind of space. They can't make that noise and they don't have the money or won't spend the money on tools like that. And they don't really need to. So you can see we've made a lot of progress in just a few minutes here. I've spent a lot more time than actually doing work. Talking and uh, a little bit of work and a lot of talking. So, all right. The check here. Okay, I didn't cross the, uh, the line here. If I did, I'd be in trouble. Um, and now we've got it closing in. Right here is the most. I'm going to add a little more right there. Now I've switched over to the medium crown end here. That'll give me a little more bang for my buck. And I'm doing it uh, in a moderate manner. I'm not going crazy on one spot. So there are no stretch marks showing or anything. So here we go. We got that up to there now. So we're going to need a little bit over here probably. No, most of it I think is right in here. Because um, this is where most of the curve takes place, right in here. It's, it's kind of flat there compared to the front section. So we'll hit it a little bit more. We'll quantify. We have index marks here. And we're down to about 7 eighths of an inch right there. So there's my location. Right there. That's where i got to hit it the most. And I could put some shrinks right in here, or take some shrinks, and that would pop it up. Uh, they might spot this sort of spontaneously appearing right now. Um, but I don't need to. I don't have to. Absolutely have to. Now I do have some really nice ruffles. I could take those shrinks and I've, I'll probably do it. I will probably take the shrinks because they're begging to be taken. So now we're down to about half an inch here. So let me go get my uh, plastic piece and we can do the shrinks actually right on top of here. All right, now I have one of my other Pro Shaper mallets here. This one has a much higher crown and I get a lot more control uh, capturing those shrinks here. So I've got, I've got the uh, panel on this. is a piece of uh, UHMW plastic and it just uh, sits on the bag really nice here. So I'm going to corral the shrink. Or the gather. And if you hold it up on its edge like this, it'll actually lock it a lot better for you. That one sort of escaped. I didn't get the benefit of it. It wasn't high enough. 
that one you see, I got I got a nice shrink act on there. So that's that. Uh, I could go over to a kick shrinker and throw a kick shrinker on there, but I uh, might do that a little bit later, but at this point we really don't need it. Again, the point of all these videos is to show the accessibility. You don't need a lot of tools. Now, some people have said, wow, Ray, you got this big, unbelievable English wheel. I don't know how much you paid for that. Well, I paid five cents a pound for it. I put the time into making it. Uh, made it uh, back in 1993 and it'll serve me and it'll serve somebody else after me, I'm sure. So now remember, um, the next panel after this one is finished is going to be this panel here. And this panel here has the louvers in it. And I stated right off the bat that I didn't have a louver press. So behind the scenes, we've been working on a louver press. So I want to show you that louver press. So we'll walk over to where the louver press is. And now you can see Javi. He's an extended learning student. He's been working on this uh, Lotus 9. It's a 1955 Lotus 9. They only made like 25 of them. And he bought this over 20 years ago. It was all damaged and everything. And he was only able to save that fender over there, which was 18 inches shorter. The car had been in a front end collision and a rear end collision and had been pancaked pretty good. So he fixed the frame and he came down here and he's been taking my extended learning class. 69 years old, zero experience in shaping. And he's got some help from students. So I went with that program with extended learning, you can bring your car in and actually take advantage of some of the students working on your car for free. Um, of course, there's a fee for the extended learning program. And some of it's a little rough, but this is all be uh, uh, planished out eventually. And that's one of the skill sets that Javi is working on now. Uh, this was made by a student, uh, Anthony from Pittsburgh. He made this left front fender. He did a beautiful job. All this was done with flexible shape patterns. In fact, the flexible shape patterns for this fender were taken off of this fender, which was 18 inches shorter, and we had to stretch it back out again. And uh, it's been semi planish but it was good enough to get the, the surface information, and that's how that fender was made. And Javi's made a lot of these panels and uh, did a lot of detail work. We got wired edges and hemmed edges, and we got bead rolled uh, joggles here. There's a tunnel panel that goes here. And uh, he was able to borrow another Lotus 9 that was down in Connecticut that was an original. And we were able to get the surface information for these beautiful wings. The car was designed by uh, Frank Costin for uh, Colin Chapman, owner of, of Lotus cars. And, and cars like this, the 7 and the 9 and the 11, would really put Lotus on the map and they're now a engineering powerhouse. Incredible company, incredible story. So it's a, it's a beautiful shape, uh, one of the most beautiful shapes I think in cars and uh, really proud of Javi's work. He did a really nice job. So we're going to go over to the Louver Press. So this is the new Louver Press for the, the uh, Pro Shaper shop. I designed it and made a nice little drawing of it. And I have a volunteer, Frank, who's uh, retired, and he comes in like three or four times a week for a couple, four hours a day or five hours a day. He's not the best MIG welder in the world, but he's coming along. And uh, it's structurally really strong. We're going to clean up these MIG wells and get them much better. We're going to lay the machine down. We've got these A-frames to, to lift it up with and we'll lay it down and we'll do all the wells on a horizontal plane and it makes them a lot easier to do. Frank's been cutting up these uh, 45 gussets. We're going to get those in here. We're going to put one in here, one in here, and then get them all welded up. And then we'll lay the thing down and do all our wells much better. And then the mechanism is going to be right here and it's going to be a hydraulic uh, operation and the dies will be attached here to a die plate and then a, a movable die plate over here but it's going to be a really rugged machine a lot of people have seen this and they said wow you made it so strong well i have a friend that gets scrap metal and the, he brought me this scrap metal and i might not have uh, made it like this had i not had that scrap metal the scrap metal that i bought from uh, my friend 
um, has dictated the design and it's going to be a really super rugged, super strong machine. I think it's going to do those louvers on the E-type bonnet really nice. So, we're back to this, this spot again. We got to bring it up a little bit more and we'll tip it over. Now how much are we actually uh, thinning the metal here? I'll guarantee you that we're not thinning it more than three or four or five thousandths of an inch. That's it. It's insignificant. This metal will be super strong. It'll be a great dent resistance. It's not really an issue. If you have a really big uh, shape, then yes, you definitely have to shrink. In this case here, you don't need to. And this would go a lot faster if I chose to anneal the metal too. But I can choose to anneal it, I can choose not to anneal it. Doesn't matter. Alright, so I'm getting close. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to wheel this smooth. Why am I going to do that? Because I want to settle this stuff all down. I'm reading highs and lows, which are the mountaintops and the little valleys here. And um, we'll get this all smoothed out in the wheel and then we'll go another round on it. When we smooth it out we also make it uniform again. We've upset the balance there. People will say that that's all work on and the metal is going to crack and break and all this other stuff. Once I wheel it it'll be all loosey-goosey. It'll be nice and soft and malleable and then we can shoot it up again with the hammer and get that last little bit. So we're almost up to the top of where we, or the mountain of where we need to be. We've got that last little hike to get to the, to the peak. So we're going to wipe this down to get the, the dust off of it. We're going to take it out of arrangement and we're going to wheel it. And I'm going to put some area in this spot too. I'm going to stay out of that valley. Remember, thou shalt not wheel or hammer in the valley. All right, so now we're going to set the arrangement so that it'll be favorable to wheeling this out. We've got it dusted pretty good. And we're going to open this up. I want to put some gloves on and then we will go from there. And this is stiff, really stiff. Oh boy. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost hot as stainless. It's amazing. All right, so that'll crunch down in the wheel. I'll get it. So I'll put it in here. Uh, had a class this past weekend and the wheels were pretty dirty so we washed the wheels up, we, we uh, polished them. I have the video showing how to polish those wheels. And when you're knocking down these walnuts it's best to do it pulling it through. When you pull it through you have a lot more control over it. And it only takes a minute or so to knock it down. And that was super stiff and you'll see that in no time it'll be malleable. So I want to get the arrangement into a curl arrangement here. So I'm pulling down as I wheel. And I've got to watch for the edge of this is a super wide wheel and I'm going to watch for it hitting here in the valley. If I see a mark here, uh, I've got to amend my ways here and stay out of that valley. So I'm watching that like a hawk. As I'm wheeling, the issue here is just to knock these walnuts down right at this moment. And I'll keep tightening this up. And I'll pull down because the more I pull down, the more curl I induce into the panel, the lower the crown goes. It'll go from a higher crown to a low crown depending on how much curl I put into the panel. So 
So now you can see, I think the camera can pick that up. These are a little scarring effect from the hammer blows. And these will all get cold forged together. Right now you see there looks like to be a modeling effect or so. Um, and this will all go to a chrome plate mirror finish. They'll all get uh, um, forged, cold forged back together again. So the microstructure of the metal uh, with the malleting, yes, it can cause some damage if you're excessive with it. But if you do it moderately and then follow up with compression stretching with the wheel, it'll come out really nice. So it'll look exactly like it was when we first started. Actually better because it'll be chrome plate look. Now we'll load up the pressure. So just a few minutes of wheeling here. Most of the walnuts are gone. There's a little residue inside here. I'm going to stay away from that because I don't want to get into that valley. Yeah, I'm just starting to hit the valley now. i to stay away from that. Now I want to show you the close-up again. Um, you just saw that a minute ago of the, the little bit of uh, scarring action that caused this little mottled effect. And you can see it's all healing back together again. All that stuff will disappear in a matter of minutes. But if you use a hammer that's way too sharp, such as this one, this can be a dangerous tool. A lot of people will gravitate to that, figuring that that moves the metal a lot faster, but it scars the metal a lot faster. You only want to use a hammer or a mallet like this only if you need to, and you've got to use it in little taps and let them accumulate rather than hard taps. So, we've got a good hump going here. We've got to get some hump going on in this part of the panel where it has a good compound staying out of that valley. So, all right, this is that grainy metal again. We have the, that whistling noise there, which will disappear after a little bit. Sort of a love-hate relationship with this metal. I, I hate the fact that it works so hard. Um, the metal I used to get that was in China source would work twice as easy as this, but it wasn't um, as stiff as a finished product as this stuff is. So it has its positives and negatives like everything else. pressure. Remember when you go into the wheel, don't do the spin starts and all that stuff. You go in at a 45, you don't need a, a quick release. The 45 will let you right in real easy. 45 is your friend. And in the center of this region is where most of the crown has to happen, so that's where I'm going to dwell a lot of my time there. But you have to hit the entire panel too, so I'm coming way out to the end here also. I'm going to have to uh, do the same on this section over here, so I'll steer over here and I'll give a little bit right in here. And you see the panel starting to shine up now. We're getting that uh, really beautiful look. If you take your time, the whole car made like this, minus the, uh, the weld seams, will look just like a mirror. It wasn't buffed. 
it's just the way and they will come off the wheel if your wheels are polished properly. They gotta be polished really nicely. Okay, now let's take a look at where we're at. So, we've got this uh, curl here. We don't even care about that, doesn't mean a thing. Our first order of business is getting the area value. This is an area value tool. It only gives you the area value. The gauges give you the arrangement value. The area value has to come first, then the arrangement value. So, now we put this on here and it's fitting nice and tight in here. And it's actually a little loose over here, so I might have went a little bit too much right here. All I have to do is wheel that edge. That's a great indicator of where you need to stop. So I'll have to wheel that just for about a minute or so, and that'll bring that area up to meet this area. What are we doing here in, in this? We need a little with deficient right here. We're almost here on this part. It's not bad at all. And right there that's the worst right there always go for the worst section so I can mark that with a pen and keep in mind sometimes these marks uh, will go right into the aluminum all right almost I, I mark this front of this uh, power bulge here and the aluminum uh, is embedded the magic mark is almost like embedded right in there no big deal because that's all going to be sanded eventually to be painted or buffed if you buffed it it would go away so I don't have a, a, a strict policy about marking panels up but just do it when you absolutely have to so there's the spot and I transfer that underneath and that's I'm going to mallet it some more there so my order of business here is I, I've done an assessment. I'm a little overdeveloped here, meaning I have to release it on this edge, and I'm underdeveloped here. So you always start out at an underdeveloped state, and then you work your way up to a fully developed state. So we'll bring this panel up a little bit more, and we'll see where we're at. So we get the hammer mallet. I was calling it a, mall a hammer. It's a mallet. I use Delrin heads on my mallets. I used to uh, have uh, UHMW but the Delrin is better. It gets marked up a little and you should actually clean them up a little but I haven't had a chance to do it yet. So I'm gonna bring this out a little bit more right in here. Now you always want to leave a little room for finishing with the wheel so that you can uh, compression stretch that and forge, coal forge it all together and get these stretch marks all settled down. So we pounded that up and let's see what we have. And again, this is the beauty of the flexible shape pad. And if you offer this up to a wood buck or a wire form or any type of buck, it, it, the buck would reject it because it's not in arrangement. In order to work on a buck, it has to be in arrangement. That's the beauty of the flexible shape pad system is it doesn't have to be in arrangement to tell you what the next step is. So, all right, I'm going to put a little hammer blow down in here too. Because that needs, a, uh, well, maybe even a little bit in here. So right along here, adjacent to the valley, about an inch and a half in. And it needs a little more over here. Sure. Not going. I checked to where my hammer blows are. I got to go inboard a little bit more. If you look, what do we have here? We have a standard compound curve here, 
rocking this way, rocking that way, stand it here, stand it here, and lo and behold, the reverse has magically appeared. We haven't done anything, it just comes on in its own. So, that's the magic of a reverse curve. Stay away from it. It'll, it'll form itself if you work around it. There are a few exceptions, and I'll cover them in my videos eventually, but not tonight. Hit check, hit check, hit check. I tell my students, hit check, hit check, hit check. Don't hit, 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 check. Because you're going to be in trouble. So, here we go. Now, magically, it's actually, well, it's still a little up here. I'll right, wheel that a little bit more. Got to dust it. We'll bring the the wheeling down here and get this tail end of this. Get all the dust off. You don't get the dust off. The dust is residue from the plaster we use to kill the sticky. Uh, that that plaster will get on the wheel and kind of embed into the panel. Um, there's actually a little bit on it. I should probably clean it a little bit here. Always keep the wheels clean. Always be vigilant for foreign material. If you watched my uh, last video, I believe it was the, now it was two videos away, making art with the English wheel, how you can emboss with the English wheel. Check that one out if you haven't seen it. And that was uh, being able to use the the characteristic that the English reel will do if you have foreign material, it'll print itself over and over again. You can use that to your advantage. So I printed some really nice patents in the metal. If you haven't seen that video, check it out. It's a really good one. It hasn't really gotten it much attention. It really deserves more attention. A lot of beautiful projects can be made with that technique. So I got that smooth. I'm gonna pump the pressure up a little bit. Staying away from that valley. Pump the pressure up a little more. This way you can really add a lot of pressure. It'll move this aluminum really fast. I found that the classes, people really do like the bash metal rather than wheeling it. That's one of the first things they want to do is just get a mallet and bash some, some aluminum or steel. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it lets out frustration and uh, gives them some kind of psychological relief or whatever. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But it's a, it, maybe it's a natural male thing. They just want to break and bash something. <laughs> Now remember, if you make any mistake, and you're going to make mistakes, that's the name of the learning any craft, is moderating the mistakes, not eliminating them. It's impossible to eliminate them. Um, the beauty of this craft is it allows you to make a lot of mistakes and still recover. you got to be really, you know, egregiously bad in your your habits to make a mistake that's so bad, which would be hammering the valley, uh, the reverse curve valley. So here I am, I'm releasing that edge a little bit, and that should be enough. So, we'll come over here a little closer to the valley, and I'm very conscious of the edge of this wheel it's going to bite on the valley if I don't watch it so is that a major sin now but I want I want to keep track of that I don't want it happening if I see one I'm going to stay away from it 
And I'm going to go all the way down to the end of the panel here because every panel, all the panel has to be worked. Every single square inch of the panel has to have some attention. You can't ignore any spot, every little bit of it. Now I can change up and go this way on the end here because it's hard to do right up to the edge sometimes. Now you're going to see me eventually come through the valley this way. I'm going to do that because you need that to form this valley the way you want it. But when I'm doing that, it's going to be really low pressure and it's more of a forming operation than a shaping operation. More of an arrangement rather than adding area. So, as you can see, the panel is starting to chrome up. We've been giving it most good attention right here. I haven't been able to get in with that wide wheel. That's going to require me going this way, the uh, 90 degrees to the valley. And let's take an assessment of where we are. So we started out, this thing wasn't fitting for beans, and now it's fitting pretty damn good. So look at that. We got a reverse over here. That's that same reverse that we had to put in here we'll end up having to stretch this edge a little bit right here. So this will have to get cut off so I don't have to work all that metal. That'll be later. And uh, we're a little loose down here, so that need, needs a little attention. We're a little loose in here. That still needs a little attention, but we're pretty good on the edge. Good on all the surrounding edges. Well, this is Ray Shaleen. I'm signing off on uh, part 9A of the E-Type All Aluminum Nose. I think you had... Uh, a, a good story tonight showing the, the first part of the development of this panel and hopefully we can finish it in 9B and I also showed you the Lotus and the louver press so I would like to try to keep these videos under an hour and I think we're close to it now so uh, thank you very much for watching and this is Ray Shaleen from Pro Shaper Sheet Metal in Charlton please subscribe please share and add comments and add qu ask questions. I answer everything I possibly can. A shout out and thanks to Zeke and Randy again for the presents they sent me. I re really appreciate them. Thank you very much. It's good racially and good night.